If we deform an object and imagine cutting out a tiny plate inside it, then the force acting on that plate is determined by a second order tensor, the stress tensor. But wait, force is a vector, so what does a second order tensor have to do with it? And why are there different definitions of stress tensors at small and large deformations? That's exactly what this video is about. We will first look at the stress tensor when deformations are small, and then we will see what changes when deformations become large. Along the way we will introduce the Cauchy stress tensor and the first and second piola kirchhoff stress tensors, and discuss their physical interpretations. Ok, let's start simple. Before we talk about stress, we need to be clear about what force and traction mean. Consider a simple example, an object resting on a surface. Depending on its mass, the object exerts a certain force on the surface. This force is described by a vector, which we will denote by f bar. Now let's assume that this force is evenly distributed over the contact area. In that case we can define another vector valued quantity that represents the force per unit area. This force per unit area is sometimes loosely called stress. However, in continuum mechanics, stress means something slightly different. The force per unit area acting on a surface is instead called traction, and we denote it by T. If the traction is constant over the area A, then the total force acting on that area is simply T times A. However, in continuum mechanics, we are not just interested in tractions that act evenly distributed over perfectly flat surfaces. Instead, we are interested in all the tractions acting inside objects. And this is exactly what we need the stress tensor for. Let's consider an object and apply some force to it. We assume for now that the resulting deformation is very small. Now imagine cutting out a tiny thin plate at a specific point inside the object. This plate is called an infinitesimal area element. Because we have applied forces at the boundary of the object, there may be some tractions acting on this area element. And because the area element is so tiny, we can assume that the traction is constant over the area element. But now imagine cutting out another tiny plate at the same point, oriented at a different angle. At this angle, another traction may act on the area element. So, depending on the orientation of the area element, different tractions can act at the same point inside the object. And this is exactly why we need a second order tensor to describe stress at a point. In a fixed coordinate system, the stress tensor sigma is essentially a 3 by 3 matrix. This matrix contains all the information about the tractions acting on area elements with any possible orientation. But how can a 3 by 3 matrix describe all these different tractions? This is possible by defining the stress tensor in such a way that it gives us the traction T, when it is multiplied by a unit vector n that is perpendicular or normal to the area element. By defining the stress tensor this way, it gives us the traction acting on an area element with any orientation. If you give me the stress tensor and an arbitrarily oriented area element, then I can identify a unit normal vector n that is perpendicular to the surface and compute the traction simply by multiplying the stress tensor by n. In this way, the stress tensor encodes all the information about the tractions acting on area elements of any possible orientation. By convention, the unit vector n is chosen to point outward from the area of interest. If we flip the sine of n, we obtain the outward unit normal on the opposite side of the area element. Multiplying the stress tensor by this vector then gives the traction acting on the other side. The relationship t equals sigma times n is known as Cauchy's theorem, and the stress tensor sigma is therefore also called the Cauchy stress tensor. The formula tells us the traction acting on an area element, and once we know the traction, we can also compute the total force acting on that element. Let's denote the area of the infinitesimal area element by dA. The total force dF bar acting on this element is then the traction t times the area dA or sigma times n times dA. The quantity n times dA has a special meaning. It completely describes both the orientation and the size of the infinitesimal area element. It is a vector that points in the direction of n and whose magnitude is equal to the area of the element. We denote this vector by dA written in bold. With this definition we obtain another interesting formula. 
the force acting on an area element is simply the stress tensor sigma times the area element vector dA. From undergraduate mechanics we know that force is obtained as stress times area. The stress tensor generalizes this idea to arbitrarily oriented area elements in our object. So now we know how stress is defined for small deformations. Before we move on to stress at large deformations, I'd like to show a few other ways to physically imagine stress. Instead of cutting out an area element, imagine cutting out a tiny sphere around a specific point inside the object. This is called an infinitesimal volume element. It has outward unit normal vectors pointing in all directions along its surface. If we know the stress tensor, we can use Cauchy's formula to compute the traction acting at any point on the surface of the sphere. This gives us a very intuitive way to visualize the stress tensor. Personally, I also like to imagine stress in the following way. Suppose we cut out a tiny sphere and then slice this sphere along some plane. The stress tensor then tells us the traction acting on the cut surface. In this way it tells us whether the two half spheres are being pressed together, pulled apart or sheared relative to each other. And no matter how we orient the cut, Cauchy's formula tells us what traction acts on it. Finally note that the Cauchy stress tensor must be symmetric. If you want to learn more about this and understand what each component and each column of the stress tensor mean in a fixed coordinate system, you can watch my previous video on a stress tensor. Ok, let's proceed with large deformations. But before that, if you like this video and want to support my channel, consider becoming a channel member. Members get small perks like early access and shoutouts. And the basic membership is just a dollar. Thank you so much for your support. Ok, next we will look at how stress is defined when deformations become large and why there are different ways to define stress tensors in that case. Consider a deformable object. We cut out a tiny sphere at a point of interest. When we apply forces at the boundary of the object, the object deforms and the tiny sphere deforms as well. As discussed in earlier videos, the local deformation of this tiny sphere is described by the deformation gradient F. The tractions acting on the surface of the sphere in the deformed configuration are described by the Cauchy stress tensor. We denote the outward unit normal vector in the deformed configuration by lowercase n, and the corresponding tractions t are computed using Cauchy's formula. So the Cauchy stress tensor is defined in the same way as for small deformations. The only difference is that for small deformations we could still picture the deformed element as a sphere. For large deformations, the sphere becomes an ellipsoid, but the definition of the Cauchy stress remains the same. Just as before, we can cut the deformed element along any plane, and Cauchy's formula gives us the traction acting on the cut surface. Another way to visualize this is to cut out a tiny area element in the undeformed reference configuration. We denote the outward unit normal vector of this element by capital N and the area by D capital A. Together, the normal vector and the area fully describe both the orientation and the size of the element. We combine them into a single vector denoted by D capital A, written in bold. As we deform the object, the area element deforms and changes its orientation. The outward unit normal vector of the deformed area element is lowercase n and its area is D lowercase a. Combining the two, we get the deformed area element vector d lowercase a written in bold. The force acting on the deformed area element is given by sigma times the area element vector dA. This means that the Cauchy stress has a clear physical interpretation. It gives us the force acting on an area element in the deformed configuration when it is multiplied by the deformed area element vector. But this is not the only way to define stress. In continuum mechanics, it can be useful to introduce different measures of stress that make calculations easier. The Cauchy stress gives the force acting on a deformed area element when multiplied by the deformed area element vector. A natural question is, can we define another stress tensor that gives the same force but when multiplied by the undeformed area element vector D capital A? The answer is yes. This stress tensor is called the first piola kirchhoff stress, denoted by P. So next we will see how this tensor is related to the Cauchy stress tensor and why it can be useful to work with it instead.
To understand how the Cauchy stress and the first Piola Kirchhoff stress are related, we have to understand how the deformed and undeformed area element vectors are related. We already know from previous videos that a deformed line element d lowercase x equals the deformation gradient f times the corresponding undeformed line element d capital X. And we know that a deformed volume d lowercase v equals the determinant of f, which is denoted by j, times the undeformed volume d capital V. We won't go through the entire derivation here. But from these formulas we can derive that the deformed area element vector d lowercase a equals j times the inverse of f transposed times the undeformed area element vector d capital A. The term in front of the undeformed area element vector is called the cofactor of f. It has a nice physical interpretation. It gives us the deformed area element vector when multiplied by the undeformed area element vector. This formula is called Nansen's formula, and with Nansen's formula it's quite easy to see how the Cauchy stress and the first Piola Kirchhoff stress are related. We know that df equals sigma times d lowercase a. We can substitute Nansen's formula to arrive at df equals sigma times the cofactor of f times d capital A. So the first Piola Kirchhoff stress must be the Cauchy stress times the cofactor of f. So now we know another stress tensor that gives us the force acting on a deformed area element when we multiply it by the undeformed area element vector. But why is this actually useful? We won't go into details here, but when we compute deformations of objects with complex geometries, for example using the final element method, we often need to evaluate integrals over the surface of the object. In practice, it's usually much easier to formulate these integrals over the undeformed surface rather than the deformed one. The reason is simple. The undeformed surface is known, while the deformed surface is part of the solution and has to be computed. The physical interpretation of the first Piola Kirchhoff stress is not as straightforward as that of the Cauchy stress. It is sometimes described as the current force per undeformed area, but it's hard to interpret this physically. Why should a force in the deformed configuration act on an area defined in the undeformed configuration? This is not something we can easily visualize. The interpretation of the Cauchy stress, on the other hand, is much clearer. It represents the current force per deformed area, which is why it is often called the true stress. I like to think of the first Bueller Kirchhoff stress as an auxiliary stress measure. It is useful because it simplifies certain computations in continuum mechanics but its physical interpretation is less direct than that of the Cauchy stress. So now we already know two different definitions of stress. The Cauchy stress describes the current force per deformed area, while the first Bueller Kirchhoff stress describes the current force per undeformed area. Next we can introduce yet another definition of stress, the second Bueller Kirchhoff stress tensor, capital S. It describes a force in the undeformed reference configuration per undeformed area. Up to now we have considered the force d lowercase f bar as a force in the deformed configuration. But what if we assume that there exists a force d capital F bar in the undeformed reference configuration, which is mapped to the deformed configuration by the deformation gradient, much like how undeformed line elements are mapped to deformed line elements by the deformation gradient. We now define the second piola kirchhoff stress tensor as the tensor that gives us the reference force d capital F bar when it is multiplied by the undeformed area element vector. But how must S be defined to fulfill this relationship? To find this out we first invert the relationship d lowercase f equals f times d capital F. Now we can substitute the definition of the first Piola Kirchhoff stress and finally see that the second Piola Kirchhoff stress is equal to the inverse of f times the Cauchy stress times the cofactor of f. Similar to the first Piola Kirchhoff stress, the physical interpretation of the second Piola Kirchhoff stress is not as clear as that of the Cauchy stress. Roughly speaking, the second Piola Kirchhoff stress represents a force in the undeformed reference configuration per unit undeformed area. However, from a physical point of view, it is not obvious what a force in the undeformed reference configuration actually means. The true force d lowercase f bar acts in the deformed configuration. Mapping this force back to the undeformed reference configuration 
using the inverse of the deformation gradient yields an auxiliary force d capital F bar, which has a less direct physical interpretation but can be useful for simplifying computations. To summarize, we introduced the Cauchy stress tensor sigma. This is the true stress because it gives the current force when multiplied by the deformed area element vector. Then we introduced the first Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor P by mapping the undeformed area element vector to the deformed area element vector with the cofactor of the deformation gradient. The first Piola Kirchhoff stress gives the current force when multiplied by the undeformed area element vector. And finally, we have mapped the current force to the reference force with the inverse of the deformation gradient and defined the second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor S which gives the reference force when multiplied by the undeformed area element vector. At the end you should note that you may encounter different definitions of the stress tensors in textbooks and papers. In this video we have defined the stress tensors so that the force is obtained by multiplying the stress tensor by the area elements. Some authors however use a slightly different convention in which the transpose of the stress tensor is multiplied by the area element vectors to obtain the force. For the Cauchy stress tensor and the second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensors, this distinction is irrelevant because both tensors are symmetric. But the first Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor is not symmetric in general, and the chosen convention matters. Therefore, whenever you work with stress tensors, especially the first Piola Kirchhoff stress, it is important to check which definition is being used and to remain consistent throughout your analysis. Before we end the video, I would like to clarify something from the previous videos. In the previous videos, I said that the stress doesn't change when we rotate the deformed object. This is not true in general. It is only true for certain stress measures. If we impose a rigid body rotation with the rotation matrix Q on the deformed configuration, the second Piola Kirchhoff stress remains unchanged. However, the first Piola Kirchhoff stress changes according to the formula Q times P and the Cauchy stress changes according to the formula Q times sigma times Q transposed. This means that the second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor is a Lagrangian tensor, the first Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor is a two-point tensor, and the Cauchy stress tensor is a Eulerian tensor. I apologize for the mistake, I hope it didn't cause too much confusion. We will discuss the effect of rigid body rotations on stress tensors in more detail when we cover the strain energy density in one of the upcoming videos. At the end I want to thank all the channel members for supporting the channel. And a special thanks to the first great supporter, Francis Giraldo. Thanks for staying till the end and see you soon, bye!